Lord God, you are king. You have always been king. You are king over all kings, over every petty tyrant, over every dweller on the earth. You reign. Oh Lord, how we long for the day when your reign will be manifest. It will be obvious. It will be seen and felt on this earth. You have ruled for all of history with your invisible providence, meticulously sovereign over every detail. But you will reign in a way that every eye will see. Every knee will, in fact, bow and every tongue will confess that you are Lord. God, we pray today that you would be king in our hearts that you would reign over our wills, that you would subdue those bits and pieces that want to run from you. Lord, we pray that our wills would be totally sold out to yours. It's hard to live in this world. It's hard to live in this world that rages against you or ignores you altogether. It's hard to be faithful but it's worth it. Lord, even by your word today, give us strength and encouragement for what lies ahead, that you may be glorified. We are so grateful to be your citizens, to be sons and daughters, to be friends, to be your slaves. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. I'm not going to sing for you this morning. I just sang with you. But I want to recite some song lyrics, if I may. Why are the nations in an uproar and the peoples devising a vain thing? The kings of the earth take their stand and the rulers take counsel together against Yahweh and against his anointed, saying... Let us tear their fetters apart and cast their cords away from us. He who sits in the heavens laughs. Yahweh scoffs at them. Then he will speak to them in his anger and terrify them in his fury, saying, As for me, I have installed my king upon Zion, my holy mountain. I will surely tell of the decree of Yahweh, says the son. He said to me, you are my son, today I've begotten you. Ask of me, and I will surely give the nations as your inheritance, and the very ends of the earth as your possession. You shall break them with a rod of iron, you shall shatter them like earthenware. Now therefore, O kings, show discernment. Take warning, O judges of the earth, worship Yahweh with reverence, and rejoice with trembling. Do homage to the son, S-O-N that he not become angry and you perish in the way. For his wrath may soon be kindled. How blessed are those who take refuge in him. Those are, of course, the lyrics to a famous song, one that has been sung for generations by thousands, perhaps hundreds of thousands, perhaps millions. Psalm 2 in your Bible. That's on Israel's Spotify playlist. It has been sung and sung and sung, and we in our day have their songbook. But what does Psalm 2 talk about, and when will it happen? Because the details of that song have not yet come to pass. That song was given by the inspiration of God, or the breathing out of God as His Word, And God cannot lie, and his words don't end up aimless. His words don't fall to no effect. And whenever you find that in your Bible, some declaration from God, some prediction, some promise, and you can't look up in the history books, when did that happen? You must write in the margin of your Bible, when will that happen? And that's true for a number of the Psalms. We think of them as songs written in history, set in history, talking about contemporary events, but this one, Psalm 2, speaks to the future. The future's still for us. It hasn't happened yet. 
In Acts 4.26, the apostles quoted Psalm 2 to describe Jesus' mistreatment at the hands of Herod and of Pilate. But Psalm 2 has not yet been fulfilled. Psalm 2, in fact, depicts the scene of the text we're looking at this morning in Revelation 11. The scene in Revelation 11, 15 through 19, is the announcement of the most important, most momentous event in earth's history. And I do not believe that's overstatement. The scene we're looking at this morning was made necessary by the fall, was made possible by the death of Jesus Christ on the cross. And it is simply that Jesus will reign. That event affects everybody. Not everybody benefits from the cross of Christ. But everyone will experience the reign of Christ one way or another. He will take over the world from its usurpers and its destroyers. And he will make the world what it should have been. He will reign forever. You remember where you were and what you were doing at various momentous events in your own life. I can tell you precisely where I was standing, what I was holding in my hand when I received a phone call that my dad had been killed. Some of you may be old enough to remember where you were on December 7th, 1941, the day that will live in infamy, Pearl Harbor. Maybe you remember July 21st, 1969, when Neil Armstrong placed the first human footprint on the moon. If you're old enough, you can recall your exact situation on September 11th, 2001, when people were killed and our way of life changed. Perhaps you remember your situation during COVID-19, excuse me, COVID-20, and 21, and 22. Many died, and our way of life changed. Those momentous events seal for us our circumstances that we experienced when we were in them. You, you remember in vivid detail. And we dare not look at this text this morning and walk away unchanged. You ought to remember the first time you laid eyes on the verses we are going to look at this morning. Where were you at in life? Where were you at with the Lord? What were you thinking about? What was your life occupied with when you encountered these words for the first time? We dare not look at this and be unchanged. Now, John the Apostle got to see the events recorded here firsthand. Uh, the heavenly chorus depicted in this text, they respond to the good news of the rescue of the world in this text. They, they are there. You and I have something like the nosebleed sections. Uh, we're, we're not courtside. We're, we're not right there firsthand experiencing. We get this secondhand. We trust it by faith. We, we believe God's word. But if you are a Christian, you will actually find yourself in this event when it happens. You will be there. And this changes everything. Read with me, Revelation chapter 11, beginning in verse 15. We'll read to the end of the chapter. Then the seventh angel sounded, and there were loud voices in heaven saying, The kingdom of the world became the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ, and he will reign forever and ever. And the 24 elders who sit on their thrones before God fell on their faces and worshiped God, saying, We give you thanks, O Lord God, the Almighty, who is and who was, because you took your great power, you began to reign. The nations were enraged, and your rage came. And the time came for the dead to be judged and to give reward to your slaves, the prophets and the saints and those who fear your name, the small and the great, and to destroy those who destroy the earth. And the sanctuary of God, which is in heaven, was opened. And the ark of his covenant appeared in his sanctuary. And there were flashes of lightning and sounds and peals of thunder and an earthquake and a great hailstorm. What we have in this text is the, 
the ending of the second series of tribulation judgments known as the trumpet judgments. And the second series of tribulation judgments concludes with four arresting events. Those four arresting events will serve as our outline for the message this morning. But I want to give you fair warning. There are four points in the sermon outline. If we get to point four in about 20 minutes, I don't want you to think the sermon is nearly over. That you get to go have brunch at Lush Cafe across the parking lot a little bit early today. Fair warning, the seventh trumpet is going to lead us this morning to five additional sermons. And it intends to meddle. This text intends to get underneath the skin and dig into our hearts a little bit this morning. So after the outline is done, be prepared for five sermons. Um, We won't go past our allotted time. But we won't end early either. What is described in this text will change the world when it comes. But for now, this text needs to change us. Let's look first of all at these four arresting events. There is in verse 15 an ominous blast. Look down at verse 15 with me. The seventh angel sounded. This is a seventh angel holding a seventh trumpet and he sounds the trumpet. What we have here is a heavenly blast piercing the air, sounding out from heaven, and it is a signal that a seventh judgment, each of these judgments related to seven trumpets, is coming. John here in this vision is back in heaven. Notice he says that in verse 15, there were loud voices in heaven. John is there, he's been transported there across space and across time. And you might be asking at this point in the book of Revelation, why back and forth? There's a vision in heaven, then there's a vision of earthly things. Then there's a vision in heaven again, and then we're back to the earth. John is in heaven, John is on earth. Why all of this transportation for the poor prophet? And I think what this does for us is it connects heavenly realities with earthly realities. We have our eyes down here, we go about our business, we think we're all on our own and we're just doing our thing on this little blue marble hanging out in space. Nothing could be farther from the truth. We are vitally connected to what goes on in the throne room of God in heaven beyond our universe. And in the book of Revelation that becomes absolutely evident. What happens here accelerates like a freight train picking up speed all the way to the return of Christ in chapter 19. This seventh trumpet judgment will unfold for us more judgments that happen in rapid fire succession leading to the battle of Armageddon and Christ coming down. This seventh trumpet, just as a footnote here, is not the last trumpet of 1 Corinthians 15, or the trumpet of God in 1 Thessalonians 4.16, those mentions of a trumpet both refer to the, the last call, the last sound uh, of, a, of a summons by God for the rapture of believers in this age. And when Paul uses the word last in 1 Corinthians 15, he's not saying the the last of all trumpets that will ever be sounded forevermore. No, in fact, in the Bible, there are plenty more trumpets that happen after that one. Not only these seven trumpet judgments, but also what Jesus refers to as the last trumpet and Zechariah refers to in Zechariah 9 as that trumpet of God that sounds when Jesus returns to the earth. There will additionally be trumpets at festivals during the millennial kingdom after Jesus returns. Think of last trumpet in 1 Corinthians 14 or the summons of the church in the rapture as something like last call. Last call for seconds. Does that mean we're never having seconds again after this? We pray not. (laughs) Last call for dessert. No, it just means the last summons right now in this time for this thing. The, The context describes for you what is last. I was in the Boy Scouts as a kid and we had the last trumpet what was it? It was just the last bugle call of the day. And, and the bugler, often a Boy Scout who wasn't very good at it, tried to play taps. If you know the sound of taps, what did that mean? If you're in the Boy Scouts, it means no more talking after that sound. Go to sleep. Hopefully they worked us hard enough to actually enjoy sleep at that point. 
The seventh trumpet here is not the last trumpet of 1 Corinthians 15, nor the trumpet of God of, of 1 Thessalonians 4.16, nor is it the last trumpet that occurs when Jesus returns in Revelation 19. This is just the seventh in a series. And you remember how these judgments work in the book of Revelation. They're something like a telescope. When you unfold the telescope, there are layers within layers that sort of come out from the other. And, and we had seven seal judgments at the beginning. And the seventh seal judgment opened up, like a telescope, seven more judgments called trumpet judgments. And the seventh trumpet judgment telescopes out to seven more judgments that we'll discover are called bowl judgments or vile judgments. These are sort of open vessels full of the wrath of God that get poured out from heaven in a rapid series of judgments at the very end. This seventh trumpet opens up the very last final rapid fire judgments from heaven against the earth. We'll see those later in the book. When this trumpet sounds, this seventh trumpet in this text, the end comes quickly. You look back at chapter 10 and verse 6. Uh, there's an angel that swears by God, and he says at the end of verse 6, There will be delay no longer, but in the days of the voice of the seventh angel, when he is about to sound, then the mystery of God is finished, as he proclaimed good news to his slaves, the prophets." That good news is the coming of the kingdom, no more delay, the seventh trumpet brings in all the rest of the stuff in rapid fire, and then the day of man is over. What happens between chapter 11 and chapter 15, when the contents of that seventh trumpet judgment begin to unfold, so chapters 12, 13, and 14, and the beginning of chapter 15, is something of a subplot getting us back to this very moment, but rewinding a little bit. He, he's going to explain to us the, the beast, the, the false prophet, the antichrist, uh, the, the role of Israel, and, and some of those things. There are many subplots weaving together up to this moment. So for the a series of chapters, we'll back away from the chronology and trace out those subplots. After this blast comes a symphonic celebration Look down at the second half of verse 15. There were loud voices in heaven saying. Do you remember back in chapter 8, verse 1, when we had the seventh seal opened and there was silence in heaven for a half an hour? No silence here. That was a, a, the silence of, I can't believe how bad this next judgment's going to be. There's no silence here, but heaven breaks forth in symphonic praise that the end is coming, that the kingdom is at hand, the end is near, and so you have loud voices in heaven. It's plural. These are unnamed, unidentified, multiple voices, but it is a great conglomeration, a loud one. It is a celebration, and it is a celebration in symphony. Notice what they say all together. The kingdom of the world became the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ, and he will reign forever and ever. Can you imagine what it would be like to be there and to have all the voices around you just simultaneously, spontaneously say these words? It would be thrilling. Notice what they say, the kingdom of this world. That's singular. Why didn't they say the kingdoms of this world? Why didn't they pull out a globe and start naming all the countries according to their borders and, and maybe their world capitals? Why didn't they name historic empires? Uh, why don't they identify counties and, and states and movements? None of that is there. You see, the world's government is seen in this text as one unit, one cohesive, antagonistic whole, with one ruler. Jesus called Satan in John 12, 31, the ruler of this world. And Jesus referred to this world as Satan's kingdom in Matthew 12, 26. Paul calls Satan the God of this world, small g God. What does that tell us about the world as we see it now? It means that it is under the governance of an enemy, 
one who is antagonistic to God and his ways. This is why John can say, do not love the world or the things in this world. If anyone loves the world or is a friend of the world, he is in hostility with God, James says. The whole world is seen as a cohesive unit of antagonism against the one who made it, against its rightful ruler. And notice what is revealed about this. What does this group say? The kingdom of the world became the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ. The word became is a past tense verb. And it's translated into our English as has become, which I think is appropriate to mark the, the, the John is getting here at the beginning of this activity. It, it helps identify the, the start of it. He began uh, to become the kingdom of God. But it marks something in the past um, because it is something that is done. Even though this is a future event. And, and when God uses a past tense verb to describe a future reality, what is the significance of that? The significance is certainty. There's no way around it. It is as good as done. And this event is future to us still. Interestingly, it's also future from the perspective of the participants in this scene. This scene depicts what is still future to us. John the Apostle, nearly 2,000 years ago in the first century AD, was transported from the first century past us into this future scene beyond us to see what would happen in the future in heaven. And in that future, that heavenly symphony will declare something that is still yet future from their perspective. And they will use past tense verbs to describe that still future event because it is certain in the plan of God. Now, if your mind is melting because of the time-space continuum, you're in good company. Well, you're in my company. I don't know if it's good, but you're in company. The point of all of these verb tenses in this is to demonstrate that this future is certain. It's inexorable. There's no way around it. It is coming and no one can thwart it and no one can change it. So much in this world is uncertain. But the word of God is forever settled in heaven. And that truth is reflected even in the past tense verbs in these future looking verses. And notice what they cry out. The kingdom of our Lord God and of his Christ. The kingdom of this world, the antagonistic unit under the guide of Satan, will become the kingdom of our Lord, that is God, and of his Christ, his Messiah, that is Jesus. They reign together. They, they are seen conflated on the thrones in the book of Revelation. Their reign is theirs together. Jesus will be the physical manifestation as king on the throne, we will see him. Listen, the universe always belonged to God. It's his by right of creation. He owns it, he rules it. Satan is always on a short leash. Satan doesn't get a blank check or a free reign. But God's reign over the universe now is invisible and providential. There are certainly times when God has intervened tangibly, visibly, miraculously. But overwhelmingly, God has ruled by providence. Notice what's said here, and he, that is Jesus, will reign forever and ever. Now, this is starkly a future tense verb. It changes and it's noticeable. And the only way you can make sense of these words is that there is a future reality to the reign of God over the universe that is different than what we've experienced up to this point. And this just makes you want to sing the refrain from Handel's Messiah. Again, I won't do it, but he shall reign forever, and he shall reign forever and ever. You just want to sing it over and over again when you read this text. And the reality is the thousand-year reign of Christ on the earth that, that Revelation chapter 20 describes bleeds into the eternal, unending reign of the eternal state in a new heavens and a new earth that Revelation 21 and 22 describe. There is continuity between those two eras or eons. And there's no interruption. 
the reality is once Messiah is seated on the throne of David, and he hasn't been seated on that throne yet, that is the, the throne of covenant promise from God that is inviolable, an unconditional promise in 2 Samuel 7. Once Messiah is seated on that throne, he will never relinquish it. His reign will never be interrupted. He will no longer rule by mediators, nor by invisible providence. His sovereignty will be manifest. It will be tangible. It could be seen and felt on this earth. It'll be obvious. You and I have known God's meticulous and benevolent sovereignty by faith. God's good. No purpose of His can be thwarted. He gets His way. But part of His plan now is to rule over a fallen and broken world and draw citizens for his kingdom unto himself by grace in the midst of that fallenness and brokenness. That's what he's doing. When he reigns in the kingdom, he'll do it in person. A number of people have wondered, what did the early church believe about end times? Maybe you've asked that question. The first 300 years of church history was dominated by a view called Kiliasm. Uh, they were called the Kiliasts. That is a word that just means the, the thousanders. What did they believe? Uh, they believed in a thousand year reign of Jesus Christ on the earth. They didn't believe they were in it then. They believed that it was future and they wrote about it and they preached about it and they taught it. Now, they had an interesting way to describe it. They, dis they, they actually laid out human history, and, and I'm not necessarily condoning all of this view. I want to put it in front of you because it's interesting. They laid out all of human history as a week, and they took the verse that says, to the Lord, a thousand years is like a day. I just take that as a simile. A thousand years is like a day. A day is like a thousand years. Uh, they took it a little less like a simile, and they compared human history to something like a week. Six days in the week were the days of man, the days of labor and toil, and the seventh day of the week was something of a Sabbath. Of course, they saw these as thousand-year periods. They calculated 6,000 years for man and 1,000 years for God's reign on the earth. Now, that's an interesting view. I, I don't think you can prove it from Scripture. But we're right around that 6,000-year mark. I don't think we'll know if they were right until we look back on their thoughts from the future. But it's an interesting supposition for people who lived 1,700 years ago. What they did take literally was the thousand-year reign of Christ at the end of Revelation chapter 20, and that that would be the bringing in of the Lord's day as opposed to man's day, and it would be a period of rest and Edenic beauty on the earth and a restoration and a rejuvenation and a return of God's created order to the way that he designed in the beginning, the way that was lost in the Garden of Eden by Adam and Eve. So their view is interesting but unprovable until we see how God works out his own timing. The data of scripture uh, tell us not to calculate days and times. No one knows the day or the hour. Uh, that's actually prohibited. And there's nothing in scripture that demands the Kiliast's view related to timing. But it is interesting that they took it literally. But that was their hope. Eventually, their view in church history was replaced by replacement. What I mean by that, it was replaced by a view that, that said, no, the kingdom is not something to look forward to then, it is something now. It, it's what we're experiencing here. And, and, and you shouldn't look forward to a future for Israel in the land during the kingdom of Messiah. That is something to look for now because the church is Israel. Additionally, they said that, um, that baptism replaced circumcision as a sign of that covenant relationship for his people. And so the, the, the present era replaced the coming kingdom, the church replaced Israel, and baptism replaced circumcision. That's sort of where the Kiliastic view was lost in church history. What happens next in this text is thankful worship. Look down at verse 16. 
And the 24 elders who sit on their thrones before God fell on their faces and worshiped God, saying, We give you thanks, O Lord God the Almighty, who is and who was, because you have taken your great power and you reigned. We'll get to the list in a moment. Notice these 24 elders, we saw them earlier in the throne room seen in the book of Revelation. They're on thrones, but they fall down on their faces. They have great and glorious position, and yet they reverence God. They are mere creatures. They worship in this text, and their worshiping looks like gratitude. How do they go about worshiping God in this verse? They worship giving thanks. And they give a list of expressions of gratitude. Notice whom they give thanks to. We give you thanks, O Lord God the Almighty, who is and who was. Lord is the master of all things. He is God and none other, and he is called Almighty. And that just means he has all power. He is, his power is limitless. His strength is irresistible. No one can thwart his purposes. And notice they describe him as the one who is and who was. That sounds like refrains referring to God earlier in this book. We heard about the one who is and who was and and who is coming, the coming one, the one who is to be. We saw that in chapter 1 and in chapter 4. But notice the who is coming part of the phrase is left off here. Why is it left off? Why, why, why do these 24 elders do not say the one who was and the one who is and the one who's coming? Because this is the celebration of the fact that he came, that the rain started. And, and I know they're still talking about the future. Melt your mind for a second again. From their perspective, it's still future, but they talk about it in the past because it's as good as done. They're envisioning the, the rain already begun. There, there's no more anticipation it's culmination, it's, it's fulfillment, it's, it's the thing you looked forward to, and it happened. When your kids are at Disneyland, the, the, the promised trip you've been talking about for months and months and months, when they're there, they shouldn't be asking the question, when are we going to Disneyland? They've arrived. Notice what they're thankful for. Beginning in the second half of verse 17, Because you took your great power. By the way, all of these are again in those past tense verbs, indicating the surety of what is still yet to come. They say you took your power. That is, God is in the coming kingdom going to take the power he always has intrinsically and he's going to wield it. You took your power and you reigned. You reigned. Actually, obviously, physically, tangibly on the earth. That is what Psalm 2 was singing about. The only way to see these words fulfilled in this context is to understand a worldwide, universal, total reign of God on the earth personally. He's doing something new. Next, they thank God that the nations raged. That's interesting. We give you thanks because the nations raged. It's, it's connected to the very next phrase. The nations raged and you raged. I think the first is an acknowledgement of what the world has done in its attitude towards God. Think about the hostility of the world to Christ when he was here on the earth. They loved darkness rather than light, so they didn't recognize the light when it was here. They beat him mocked him, blindfolded him, and struck him in the face and said, prophesy, who's hitting you? They made a mock crown out of thorns and placed it on his head and pressed it into his flesh. They bowed down to him in mockery. They even put a plaque over the cross. The cross was an execution device for a a hapless victim or a common criminal. And they put the placard over the top that said, King of the Jews. All of it mockery. They hated him when he was here. Consider the hostility to Christians from the world over the years. Before you knew Christ, if you know Christ here today, what what was your attitude towards Christians? Have you thought about that lately? Who, Who did you used to be? What did God rescue you from? And if it has cost you something to follow Christ, you know something of the hostility of the world. 
And for many Christians throughout church history, they have known, even to the giving of their own lives, this hostility. How will this hostility come to a conclusion? According to Revelation 16, it will come to a conclusion at the Battle of Armageddon. Satan and his demons will send out deceptions into the world, and the whole world will say, we have a fighting chance against Jesus. Let's put our forces together and let's fight. And all of that hostility will actually take up arms in a worldwide war against Christ. If they could murder him again, humanity would. The nations are enraged, verse 18, and your rage came. In other words, God's holy, good, beautiful, righteous, vindicating justice will flex its muscle. And God hasn't done this in totality yet. He wiped out most of humanity at the flood. He has incinerated cities for their rebellion. He has given countless civilizations over to their sin in judgment so they would sin more against him because that's what they wanted. But he hasn't yet done this total and complete victory and annihilation of his enemies. It's coming. Next, they give thanks because the time came. What time? Time here is the word for appropriate season. It's an era. It's not a, not a moment necessarily. Uh, it's not talking about um, chronology. This is the appropriate era for some things. And notice what happens in this appropriate era that comes. For the dead to be judged, rewards to God's people, and to destroy those who destroy the earth. What's coming is an appropriate time for God to set things right. The dead, that is the, the wicked dead who will be raised under that great white throne in Revelation chapter 20 and be assessed for all their deeds. They will be judged. There's an appropriate season for that coming. There's an appropriate season for God's people to be rewarded. Church age believers get rewarded after the rapture at what we call the Bema Seat Judgment. Tribulation saints will be rewarded at the sheep and goats judgment in Matthew 25. And then there will no doubt be rewards for those who are faithful to Christ in every era. And notice how God's people are described here. They're as slaves. They're as slaves. It's so good to be a slave to God rather than a slave to sin. <laughs> Rather than be slave to a master that wants to kill you and destroy everything that's precious to you, to belong to a master who loves you and gave himself up for you and actually loves to give and give and give what is good. And he calls you not just slaves, but friends. And not just friends, but sons and daughters and heirs of his eternal riches. What privilege and he describes here the prophets, those who got direct revelation, Old Testament, New Testament prophets who spoke the truth. John the Apostle is a New Testament prophet, but as we've seen, he flows right in line with all the Old Testament prophets saying what they said. And the saints, the set-apart ones, and those who fear your name, of all categories, the small and the great, encompasses everybody. And we think about rank and privilege and caste and status and wealth and coolness in this life. And, and all of that gets leveled out by grace. God doesn't look on the outward stuff like we do. Every individual that is his belongs to him and is precious. And it's just interesting that, that these 24 elders, these, these ones in heaven just bust out into praise of God. They're worshiping him. They've fallen on their faces and they say, thank you, God. Thank you that you are wielding your power, that you reign. Thank you that the nations rage and, and you get your justice. Thank you that the dead are judged and your people are rewarded and the destroyers are destroyed. This, this last one is poignant. The word for destroy is to corrupt or, or to pollute or to ruin. 
and for God to, to reveal that the destroyers of the earth will be destroyed, the, the polluters of the earth uh, will be brought to nothing, the ruiners will be ruined themselves. It's an interesting take on the relationship between humanity and his environment. We're connected to this world. The, the curse on man becomes a curse on the environment. This is God's green and blue earth. And so lazy, neglectful, abusive, polluting, selfish, greedy, and idolatrous earth dwellers pollute. The creation groans under the burden of humanity's failed stewardship. The creation groans under the burden of God's curse because of humanity's sin. It will one day be set free. The primary pollution intended in this verse is not the filth of plastic bottles in the ocean, though that is bad and is a failed stewardship. The primary pollution intended here, the corruption intended in this verse, is the filth of human sin, the corruption and the ruin of God's environment by who man is and what he does. It is the corruption of humanity that corrupts the earth, and the earth itself must be freed and rescued from the failed stewardship of a corrupted image bearer of God whose job it was to represent God on God's earth, but who has failed miserably. For creation to live up to its pristine purpose, humanity must be rescued from its corruption. And so these in heaven, who get to see glory all the time, rejoice and worship God and express gratitude that this restoration is coming. One author said this, when man's long carnival and carousal of selfishness is confronted by a will that is resistless, so that the nations then must bow to it or be stricken off the earth, then we shall see that events lead to that great war of the great day of God the Almighty and to a thousand years of the iron rod rule of his Messiah. Man will have his day. We get confused now with the carnival and the carousing and the selfishness. We think that's normal. It's not the way things are supposed to be, and it's not the way things will be. Following that ominous blast, the symphonic celebration, and the thankful expression of worship comes a final piece. Verse 19, we find startling revelations. Startling revelations. Look down at verse 19. John records, and the sanctuary of God which is in heaven was opened, and the ark of his covenant appeared in his sanctuary, and there were flashes of lightning, and sounds, and peals of thunder, and an earthquake, and a great hailstorm. It's interesting, chapter 11 begins with the temple and ends with the temple. The temple at the beginning is the tribulation temple built by man in Israel, and it's closed off. And then who goes in there? The Antichrist goes in there, declares himself to be God, utters the most blasphemous blasphemies, and demands that the world worship him. It just becomes an awful place. Here, this temple, which is in the sanctuary of God, which is in heaven, is opened. And it's helpful to remember that behind the scenes of the earthly tabernacle in the Old Testament, behind the scenes of the temple in Solomon's day and beyond, was this heavenly temple. Hebrews, 5, Hebrews 8, 5 describes it this way. The earthly tabernacle was a copy and shadow of the heavenly one. Just as Moses was warned by God when he was about to erect the tabernacle, for see, he says, that you make all things according to the pattern which was shown you on the mountain. The, the tent in the wilderness and, and that wonder of the ancient world, Solomon's temple, those were copies of an original. The original is in heaven, and here that original is opened up. This is an expose of the inner sanctum. And that is startling. Because who went into the inner sanctum in the tabernacle or the temple, the the holy place, and then the holiest place, the holy of holies? Only the high priest went in there, and he just once a year, and not without blood, Why? Because man was sinful? And because man had to be protected from the outshining radiance of the brilliance of a holy God. 
Man wouldn't survive the encounter. If God was going to be close to his people, there had to be veils, sacrifices, symbols of heavenly things. But Jesus, our great high priest, when he sacrificed himself on the cross, went into that holy place which is in heaven, the true temple. And he made intercession for us sinners there. And what do you have when the kingdom is on the precipice of arriving on the earth? The inner sanctum of heaven opened. It's not shut off. It's not secret. It's, it's not mysterious. It's not the place where that guy with all the robes goes in once a year. It's where all of God's people go. By the way, flip over to chapter 15 and look at verse 5. John writes, After these things I looked, and the sanctuary of the tabernacle of testimony in heaven was opened. That is a restatement of what we just read in Revelation 11.19. In other words, Revelation 11.19 and Revelation 15.5 depict the same exact event, and what happens in between them is the subplot that gets us there. Okay, we'll hold on to that. We'll come back to that thought when we get to chapter 15. But that's a little stitch to sort of hold the chronology together for you. Were you startled by the second clause of verse 19? And the ark of his covenant appeared in the temple. The ark of the covenant's there? Man, I thought that was in the basement of the Smithsonian. No, it's in the British Museum somewhere in a box. No, it's in Area 51 in a CIA crate. Where is that thing? Perhaps the Ark of the Covenant disappeared from Israel with Shishak in 1 Kings 14, or maybe with the evil king Manasseh in 2 Chronicles 33 when he was taken into captivity. I think it was likely taken by Nebuchadnezzar in the Babylonian captivity, though it is not named with the temple stuff that was taken. But wherever the Ark went and whenever it went there, it left when there was no more united monarchy on the Davidic throne in the land. And the Ark of the Covenant was given by God. Ark means box. So think Noah's Ark, floating box with eight people in it. Ark of the Covenant, golden box with the Ten Commandments inside. That box overlaid with pure gold, with the pure gold cherubim, the, the, the fiery ones, fashioned out of gold on the top, was a mark of promise and presence. It was what went inside the Holy of Holies that marked the very presence of God who dwells between the cherubim. The lid of that thing was called the mercy seat where blood was thrown to pay for sin. It is where God's presence dwelled and it made it possible for God's people to be close but not quite there. So this ark, this golden box, is a symbol of God's very presence. Open heaven means accessibility. But it is also tied as the armies of Israel carried the ark around and laid waste to their enemies in preparation for entering God's promised land. It is called the ark of testimony and the ark of covenant or the ark of promise, indicating that God keeps his word. And his word located in two specific things. Genesis 12, Genesis 15, describing God's promise about a land, a people, a blessing, a blessing to the nations through Messiah. And 2 Samuel 7, the reign of the Davidic king on the throne in the land. Both of those are inviolable promises that have not yet been fulfilled. In this scene, heaven opens up, and what's there? The Ark of the Covenant. Now, is it the prototype after which the golden one on earth was made as a copy, and then that was melted down and turned into a bunch of Babylonian trinkets? I don't know, I kind of like to think it's the real one. It disappeared off the face of the earth. I can't wait to find out. There is no ark at the return of Christ on earth. There is no ark in Herod's temple at the time of Christ when he was here the first time. We don't see an ark in the tribulation temple nor in the millennial kingdom temple. We only see the ark of the covenant and it is called that here in heaven. By the way, in the days of Samuel, Saul, and David, it spent 100 years with the Philistines and showed up again. 
I'm inclined to think maybe it'll show up still. This is a scene that gives us confidence that God is preparing the land and preparing his people for the land. That rejuvenation promise, which is the kingdom of Messiah, is coming. What does that mean? His word is forever settled in heaven. The ark is there. God himself is there. He does not lie. His promises do not fail. We can trust him. All right, I told you there would be five sermons coming out of the seventh trumpet. Are you ready for those five sermons in five minutes? <laughs> Sermon number one, Kingdom Anticipation is the title. What must this text do to us? You have to say, thy kingdom come. You have to join the heavenly chorus and say, yes, Lord Jesus, come quickly. This is good news. When, when Jesus was on the earth, what did he do as he preached? He preached the good news of the kingdom. What did John the Baptist do? Prepare the way for the king. What does the book of Acts do? Acts chapter 1 and Acts chapter 28 both describe the preaching of the kingdom in the church age. The, the church age, we're, we're preaching the gospel. What are we doing in missions? We are populating the kingdom. We're not in the kingdom. We're not bringing the kingdom. We're just populating it. We want it to come. Read through the Psalms and you will find so many like Psalm 2 that are just waiting to be sung where you can actually mean every word. We just sort of mean a lot of the words in anticipation. That anticipation will be fulfilled. What is the tribulation for? Preparation of Israel and a preparation of the earth for that kingdom. You and I ought to live in kingdom anticipation. It's what Jesus taught us to pray. Thy kingdom come. We ought to say it every day. That ought to be on our hearts. We're not in it now. It's going to be so good. Why wouldn't we pray for it? We ought to anticipate. Second sermon. We'll title this one, Persecution Encouragement. Just remember that this book of Revelation came from Jesus to an angel, to John, to seven churches in Asia Minor, modern-day Turkey, who were small, vulnerable, isolated, persecuted, many of whom had lost their stuff and their friends out of fidelity to Christ. When you need encouragement, when you face persecution, trial, discouragement, think about this reality. You might be small and vulnerable and isolated, but you're on the right team, and Jesus, your Savior, will be vindicated. You've been trying to tell people about him, and they don't believe. You just want them to know his love, and they won't listen. He's coming. Every eye will see. Don't give up. Third sermon, we're going to title this one, Earthly Politics. Earthly Politics. Go back to chapter 11, verse 15, and that refrain from the loud voices, the kingdom of the world. How many are there? Where are the borders? Where are the countries? Where are the nation states? Wait, aren't there Christian countries? No, there's no such thing. Is there a Christian nation? No, my friends, nations don't become Christians. We get confused when we think kingdom things on earthly politics. Now listen carefully. Can a Christian be involved in earthly politics? Yes. Be a Christian. Do Christian things. Use opportunities that you have. Should a Christian vote? Yes. But this is a helpful reminder for us in a year of a national election. Your votes won't bring this. And listen, the closest the Bible gets to talking about politics, the, the closest word to politics in your Bible is the word politio. You can hear the word politics in it. You know where we find that word? In Philippians 3.20. You know what Paul says in Philippians 3.20 about politics? Our citizenship is in heaven from which we eagerly await a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ who will transform our mortal bodies into conformity with his glorious resurrection body with all the power he has to subject all the nation states to his rod of iron. 
That's our politic. We live here. We have responsibilities here. I don't want to take away from those things, but they, they only go so far. They're temporal. And listen, when we read about this future history in the book of Daniel on Sunday nights a couple years back, what did we discover about the whole progress of human governments? They are beastly. Do you remember Daniel 2 and Daniel 7? How were those successive empires of human governance described? As ravenous animals devouring humanity one after the other. All of them will be replaced by the stone cut out without hands that comes from heaven and smashes all of them. Like the stone that smashed that great big statue for Nebuchadnezzar. Fourth sermon. Sanctification motivation is the title. I will just read to you 2 Peter 3. Verse 11, since all these things are to be destroyed in this way, what sort of people ought you to be in holy conduct and godliness? What sort of people ought we to be? There's an ethic with the Bible's eschatology. There's a how to live that comes right alongside all the statements about what is going to happen. These things must change us. Fifth sermon, last sermon this morning, Gospel Readiness is the title. Is your heart ready for the king's return? Do you know Jesus? Are your sins forgiven? He's coming, and no man knows the day or the hour. You don't have a guarantee of another breath on God's green earth, You don't have the guarantee that the earth just keeps spinning the way you're comfortable with. He'll come back. Do you know Jesus? After we sing our last song this morning, there will be some friends over by my right, over by a door over here. If you want somebody to pray with, someone to talk to, if you need spiritual encouragement, or if you want to know Jesus and have your sins forgiven this day, I would invite you to come meet with our friends and talk with them. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, come quickly. Return. Vindicate your own honor. Set things right. Your kingdom come, your will be done, even as it is in heaven. Lord, we feebly join our own voices to that heavenly chorus. And we sing, you will reign forever, you will reign forever, you will reign forever. And And we feel the entanglements of sin where part of us says, ah, Lord, would you have your way? Would we come to you all over again in your grace and see you rule and reign in all the corners and crevices of our own hearts? And we pray that you would reign over all the earth. Amen.